Amen. Amen. Let's start reading in James chapter 4 and in verse number 5. Amen. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep, and let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, he will lift you up. Uh, I want to preach a message this morning out of, uh, out of verse number 6, where he said, He giveth more grace. Amen? That's what I want to preach on this morning for a few minutes. More grace. There's three main struggles in the Christian life. In verse 1 through 3, we see the flesh. In verses 4 and 5, we see the pull of the world. In verse 7, we see the fight with the devil himself. That's the three main struggles that a Christian has as they live the Christian life. It takes faith to walk with God. It's not about your feelings. Sometimes we do feel it. Sometimes we get excited and you're overcome with joy. But serving God is primarily about faith. It's just being faithful and just, just have faith and believe God. Believe what his book said. In this passage, there's your part and there's God's part. If you'll do your part, God will do his part. Amen? Uh, uh, there's always man's act of faith and God's response. We must act in faith. Hebrews eleven six says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 said, For we walk by faith, not by sight. You can't simply have faith. You must exercise your faith. Amen? Jesus put mud on a blind man's eyes. Told him to go to the pool and wash in John 9. And he went and he washed. He exercised his faith. Wrenched the mud off his eyes and he was made whole. There was a man lame 38 years in John 5. Jesus said, take, rise, take up your bed and walk. That scriptural proof when you get out of bed, you're supposed to make your bed. I reckon. Amen. You kids ought to make your bed in the morning. Don't make your mama do it. You're a teenager. You're old enough to make your bed. Amen. That's good preaching right there. Every woman in the house said, yeah, preach that right there, brother. Amen. And Naaman was told to dip seven times in Jordan, and he did. Amen. God could have healed him without him dipping himself seven times in Jordan, but God wants us to exercise faith in him. Amen. Amen. We believe God. Lord, we believe you. That's how you got saved. You just trusted God. Lord, I don't understand it all. It don't make sense how you can be lost and going to hell and all I got to do is just believe <coughs> in the shed blood of Calvary and I'm saved. But it's true. That's the way it works. It's by faith. Amen. I'll give you a few things this morning about more grace. God always gives us more grace. There's always more grace during the storm and the dark time and the hard days and the rough times. God will always give you more grace. He told Paul, he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. In your weakness, my strength is made perfect. Amen. Sometimes you feel like you just can't go another step, but God always gives more grace. I want you to, I want you to notice, uh, uh, I want you to know this morning that uh, God will give us more grace in our fears. Worry causes stress, and stress is possibly the greatest killer in America. Now listen, Brother Jesus said this. <coughs> he said, let not your heart be troubled. He said, don't worry so much. You're worried about things that don't even matter. You're worried about things that may not even happen. Amen. They say that studies show that stress and worry can age you prematurely. Worry will make you sick and keep you from healing properly. It affects your uh, higher loss. Amen. That's why I'm, I'm bald from pastoring a Baptist church. They say it can cause weight gain, weight loss. It ain't caused that on me yet, but it's caused the weight gain, I think, and all kinds of illnesses. Amen. People look on medication for mental health. They say that 80 to 85% of the caseload Mayo Clinic does is people were either directly or indirectly related to stress. Stress causes almost every kind of malady and disease <coughs> known to man. 
And if you're sick, stress will keep you from healing right. So listen, brother, our fears can cause us uh, to have all sorts of problems. But the Bible tells us that He gives more grace. He'll give you grace in time of trouble, in time of the storm. And brother, when it seems like everything else is failing, He'll give you more grace. <clears throat> they say the deficit's going up. It's $18 trillion. It goes up $11,500 per second. $690,000 a minute. 41 million in an hour. If millions were turned into seconds, it would take us back 12 days. A million would take you back 30 years. A trillion would take you backwards 32 years. That's how much a trillion is. And we are in debt. Our country is in debt. Eighteen trillion dollars. That's something that'll stress you out. That's something that'll make you worry. They say for those who shop, you'd have to spend five million dollars a day for the next five hundred and forty-six years just to equal our national debt. Amen. If you laid a trillion one dollar bills end to end, they would wrap around the equator over 380 times and you'd still have 17 laps to go. reason I'm saying all that is to show you the magnitude. We hear trillions on the news all the time. We don't really realize and understand what a trillion is. But that's how deep we're in debt. We're in debt. We'll never pay it off. Our kids will never pay it off. And our grandkids will never pay it off unless a miracle of God takes place. But the Bible said that God will give us more grace in our fears. We're not to live in fear. The Bible said per Perfect love casteth out all fear. Amen. Amen. There's fears of danger. There's terrorism. There's fear. You hear every day on the news, you hear about terrorist acts, and you wonder when will it ever end. It may never end until Jesus comes back. And there's wars and famines and diseases, and there's all kinds of problems. But the Bible said He'll give us, He'll give us grace, and He'll give us more grace for our fears. Listen, brother, God will give us His presence. He'll give us His promises. Amen. He, and brother and sister, we must us pray and God will deliver us and he'll give us more grace in times of our fears. Amen. Somebody said this about fear. They said, ain't no use putting up an umbrella, putting up the umbrella until it rains. Happy is the man who's too busy to worry by day and too sleepy to worry at night. <clears throat> ain't that the truth? Fears. Don't, don't live in fear. There's no point in it. I mean, listen, they say that 90% of the stuff people worry about never even happen anyway. Amen. Just do what's right, live right, and do right, work and pay your bills, and don't even worry about it. I mean, don't go through life scared to death. I mean, I, I, I've heard of people doing things that just don't make sense, and it's all because of fear. You heard, I believe it's Franklin Roosevelt said, there's nothing to fear but fear itself, but that's not true. That's not true. If a man's breaking through your window with a gun... That's more than fear and fear itself. That's fear of a man coming through the window. Amen. That sounds good. And people like to repeat that stuff. But there is such a thing as fear. And God will give us grace in our fears. God will give us more grace in our failures. Somebody said it like this. We're fast becoming a homeless race. We're born in hospitals, raised in daycares, taught in schools, married in churches. We vacation in resorts. We entertain our friends in restaurants. We die in hospitals and are buried the uh, funeral parlors. To most families, home is a dull place that family members resort to for the minimum of sleep, a rushed meal, or to wait for the return of the family car before heading out again. The homes that we do have, that we live in, are crumbling under the weights of sin and human failures. I want to tell you something. Listen, if you've been a failure, everybody has failed. Everybody has failed at some point in time in their life. But that does not make you a failure. Amen? God will give more grace in our failures. There's been times in my life I felt like I was a complete and utter failure. And maybe I am, but I'm still trying. I'm still going. I'm still plugging. I'm still preaching and I'm still living right and serving God and living by the Bible. Hey, he He'll give you more grace in your failures. He'll keep us from failing. Jude 24, sending down to him that is able to keep you from falling. He can keep us. He's able to do it. Amen. You may be failing in a job possibly. Maybe you don't know what career you're supposed to do. Or what kind of, maybe you're having trouble on the job. But 
God will give you more grace. Ask Ronnie about that story. Ronnie can tell you about that. Amen. It's some strife, strife and stress at work. Amen. Relationships. Maybe you feel like you failed in your relationship. Maybe it's something with your family. And, and you have got feel like you're a failure uh, in your family. Maybe you feel like you, your kids has done bad things and have gone astray. And you feel like it's your fault and you're a failure. Maybe you're here this morning, your parents divorced. And you think, well, if I'd have been a better child, it would. Listen, you can't go through life blaming yourself for everything in the world. Hey, Amen. You can't go through life calling yourself a failure. Maybe you feel like you're a failure at church or at serving God. But He'll give us more grace. There's plenty of grace for God to help us and give us grace in our failures. He'll give us more grace in our faults. Everybody's got them. Everybody's got them. Debbie don't think I have any. Just one or two she mentions occasionally. Amen. Amen. David said, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Psalm 42, 5. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. God will help you. God will give you more grace in your faults. Because the Bible said, But every man is tempted when he's drawn away by his own lust. You've got faults and I've got them. Hey Amen. we got problems. I mean, we're a problem people. Don't stay out of church and say, Well, I, I, let me get my act together and I'll go back to church. Listen, you'll never get in church if you do that. That's, that's almost like people saying, Well, we're going to wait... I know I'm not saying go have a baby, but I'm just saying people get married and you should wait a little while for you get married. But I've heard people say, well, we're going to wait till we can afford it to have kids. You'll never be able to afford it. Can you believe when our kids was born, it cost about $2,000 or something like that? That's hard to believe, ain't it? I bet you can't have a baby for $2,000 nowadays. I bet you can't have one at home with a midwife for $2,000. Amen? That's about what it cost, I think, somewhere along in there. And we thought, dear God, how in the world are we ever going to pay this? $2,000. And I've been trying to make them pay for it over the years, and they still ain't paid up. Amen. Amen. But the Bible said a man is drawn away by his own lust. Everybody here has your fault, and you've got them. But don't beat yourself up because we've all got problems, and we've all got faults. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you about the faults of people. And God can use people that's got faults. Moses had a speech problem. We don't know what it was. Maybe he st st stuttered. Maybe he's like M M Mel t t t us. What if he went down and said, Pharaoh, God s s s said, l l let his people go. And the, the Bible didn't record it that way because it added 40 pages to the Bible. Maybe he talked like Elmer Fudd. Maybe he didn't say, now Pharaoh, God said, well, his people go. We don't know. Don't know what it was. But he had some kind of speech impediment for whatever reason. God allows those things in our lives to keep us humble and to show us when he does do something, it ain't you. It ain't because Moses was a great speaker. It was because he obeyed God and made himself available to God. Amen. David's armor didn't fit, but it didn't stop him. John Mark was rejected by Paul, the greatest apostle there was. Timothy had ulcers. Amos' only training was in the school of fig tree pruning. Jacob was a liar. He lied one right after the other. Amen. God blessed him. Jonah was rebellious. David committed adultery and murder. Solomon was too rich and had too many mother-in-laws. Right? Abraham was too old. David was too young. Peter was afraid of death. Y'all get, have you read that story yet about, about Abraham lying about his wife and said, that was my sister? And she is so beautiful, he had to lie about her. You know how old she was? Guess. About 75. She's still looking good at 75. I mean, a woman hits 75 and looks that good that you've got to lie to keep people off of her. They'll still, they'll kill me and take her. And that almost happened twice, didn't it? Amen, brother. She is well kept. She looked good. That goes to show you having a bunch of kids ruins you. She had no kids yet. She's still beautiful. You go to having kids, one, two, three, four, and you, you fall apart. And then the daddies fall apart trying to raise them. Can I get a witness on that? That's the truth. Amen. Peter was afraid of death, rebuked the Lord to his face. Lazarus was dead. God used him, and he was a dead man. Ain't nobody here got that problem. Jephthah was stuck in a pea patch. A couple of David's men were so ugly, they looked like lions, like the cowardly lion on the Wizard of Oz. I am king of the forest. Amen. 
All the disciples were cowards at one time or another. John was self-righteous. Naomi was a widow. Paul was a murderer. I already mentioned so was Moses. Jonah was a coward. Miriam was a gossip. The list goes on and on and on. But everybody's got their faults. Rahab was, well, you know what she was. God used her. Gideon and Thomas both doubted. Jeremiah was a bullfrog. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Jeremiah was depressed and suicidal. Elijah was burnt out. Martha was a worry wart. Mary was accused of being lazy. Samson was a long-haired womanizer. Noah got drunk. Amen. Everybody's got faults. But God can use you. God will give you more grace. Some of you young people are sitting around and waiting for something magical to happen. To get busy for God. It ain't going to happen that way. You take what God gave you and use it. Amen. I'll say fourthly, there's more grace. God will give us more grace when there's friction. I'm going to tell you, I've had to have more grace, pastor of the church. I hate trouble. I hate church trouble. I hate family trouble. I don't like it. But sometimes it happens. Somebody said this after a business meeting in a Baptist church. Officially, the results of the vote are 47 yes, 7 no. And one over my dead body. Another one said, Now while the instruments play, please shake hands with two people who are not in your clique. <laughs> That's about the way Baptist churches are. There's a little poem one time said, To live above with the ones we love. Oh, won't that be glory? But to live down here below with the ones we know, well, that's another story. Ain't that the way it is? But listen, God gives us grace, more grace when there's friction, when there's a, when there's a schism in the church and there's, there's strife and there's trouble and there's worry. If we'll trust God and pray, God will give us more grace. Amen. Amen. I knew a person recently that had gone to three different churches. Didn't even, and all three of them was a different denomination. One was Southern Baptist, one was Methodist, and one was, I forget what the other one was, something else. I thought, what? What are you? You said, preach all denominations, don't matter. It does when you go in that church and they're preaching something different. It does when you go in there and serve and work and they're baptizing babies and they're praying to Mary and all that foolishness. Listen, it does matter where you go to church and what you're being taught, what your preacher's preaching, and what your young people, and what your kids are learning. You realize... Tonight, those of you that missed Wednesday night service, that a young girl got saved at about 10 minutes till 7 right over here. I said 10 minutes till 7. I didn't say 10 minutes till 8. Before church started, we was all milling around talking and jabbering and blabbering. This girl came up wanting to get saved. Emma took her over here, led her to the Lord, opened her Bible. Amen? That's right. You don't have that happen when you got friction in a church and the Spirit's not moving. Amen? If you're in a good church and it's scripturally sound and reasonably stable and loving and God it has God and moral leadership and is doing the best they can to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, hey, listen, do everything within your power to stick with it and stay with it and God will bless you. Listen, there's always more grace in our, with our fears and our failures and our faults and even when there's friction, there's more grace. I know what I'm talking about. I've been pastoring a long time, been married a long time. I know what friction causes. Friction causes some bad things. I like things to run smooth. Amen. Don't you? Amen. Number five, let me say he gives us more grace when it comes to family. As goes the home, so goes the church. As goes the home, so goes the nation. There will never be unity in the local church without unity in our homes. This church will never be any better than the people that go here. This church will never be any more spiritual than the people that go here and how you act at your house. That's how it's going to be in here. That we can't put on a mask. We can't wave a magic wand and all of a sudden come in here and the Holy Ghost is moving. It don't work that way. Hey, we've got to have godly homes. Men's got to be leaders in all things. Women have to submit in all things. Children have to obey in all things. That's Bible. That's what God said. Amen. Don't shoot the messenger. Amen. The importance of the home. The, ho the home is important to our spouses. The home is important to our children. The home is important to our churches. The home is, is important to our nation. Amen. The home is important 
to the Lord. Thank God I'm glad there's more grace when it comes to family. If you're on the verge of splitting up or getting a divorce, hey, submit it to God. Make up your mind you're going to stick it out and tough it out. Nobody stays like they are when they first get married. When you first get married, you're young and healthy and pretty. Everybody is. Now look at us. I don't know if we look this bad when we stay single. I probably still have long, pretty blonde hair and be the perfect weight. I'm not overweight. I'm just too short for my body weight. That's all it is. <laughs> that right? I was just being a little taller. That's all. Doctor told me, Doctor, on the last time I was said, you need, need to drop a few pounds. And I told his nurse, I said, I ain't paying for this visit. I knew that already. Why should I pay him $75 for him to say, you're fat? I could have told him some things about him. You're buck tooth. Pay me $75. Look like Ernest T. Bass coming here topping that junk. Amen. <laughs> That's right. God will give us grace in our family. Listen, listen. You know why people get divorced? Because things change and it's a little bit different and it's not a glorious honeymoon all the time. Just listen, just realize that we're all human beings and we're all going to change. We're all going to age. We're all going to grow old. And when the kids start coming, they're all different. Amen. If you had 40 kids, they'd all be different. There's a guy of the day. Saw me in a place of business and stopped me everywhere I go. I told Daddy, I said, it worries me a little bit how many people know me. And he said, I know you. And I, and I told him, he said, yeah, you preached at our church one time. And he started telling me this stuff. I don't know what all he said. His great-granddaddy used to own land somewhere. And he went to this thing and he said, and so-and-so was our neighbor. He had 19 kids. 19. Imagine. You people that's got one kid and only child. Or two, you got two kids and complain about how hard it is. Well, you have four like we did. Well, you outnumber and then you can complain. Then you got something to talk about. They can outvote us if they wanted to. Amen. I'm trying to tell you something. When it seems like it's gonna, you're gonna pull your hair out and go crazy and lose your mind. Listen, listen to me, ladies. You can't just disconnect from being Obama and go out and have a, a a girls' night out and pretend you're not married anymore. All that changes when you get married and give yourself a hundred percent to your husband and to your wife. And the same thing goes for men. Amen. You're not a single man anymore. Right. Amen. Add a little cold twinge on that. Get right with God and read your Bible. I'll say God will give us more grace. Our fears and failures and faults and friction in our family. God will give us more grace. Number six, in our finances. Most people, now, I know y'all ain't going to shout, but I wish you would. Fake it. Most people that have financial trouble, it's because they're dishonest with God. Think about it. God will not bless you financially and He's not going to send you a blessing and let you make more and get a better job and make more money when He can't trust you with 10% of His money in your pocket. Why would He let you win the lottery? You owe Him $50 a week and won't even pay it. Or 60 or 60. Now don't that make practical sense? You're praying, God, give me a better job. I want to make more money. He's saying, why? You owe me money that you ain't paying me now. That's like you owe somebody money and you won't pay them. You go back to them and ask them for more. God's not a loan shark, people. Amen. He's not one of those mafia people you go to. Hey, you be honest with God and give Him what belongs to Him. And God will bless you. Your finances will get straightened out. I'm not saying you'll be rich. Nobody in here is rich. But we got plenty to eat. We got too much. There's so much stuff in our refrigerator you can't even get in it. We're a small church and we got three refrigerators back there. That's how you can tell we're Baptists. One pulpit and three refrigerators. Amen. We like to eat. We got a roof over our head. The other day when it's raining and pouring, I mean, it was just coming down. It was nice and dry inside. There ain't nobody here lives out on the street under a cardboard box. God has blessed you. Why in the world would we steal from God? Amen. If people give 10%, they rarely give over that. Now, I'm going to tell you how it was when I first started, got saved. I didn't know no better. And I'd seen other people do this, but I don't do this no more. Now, I ain't going to tell you my personal business. But I used to think if you made $181 a week, all you had to pay was $18.10. That's it. That's how people think. Don't round it off to the next dollar, Lord knows. 
But now I'm the, now I'm the other way around. I'm like, that ain't enough. That ain't enough. That, that $50 or that $100 or that whatever, that ain't enough for what God's done for me. There's been times we've left church and, uh, and I said, we stopped to get something to eat. I'll tell you, hey, I ain't got no money. You got any money? She said, no, I ain't got no money either. I said, I'll give the last $50. I had that love off of that preacher. She said, well, I didn't tell you. I'll give $50. Never have I fussed at her and said, why didn't you tell me? Why did you tell me? Listen, that revival of the night, I had pulled some money out, started putting it in a plate, and she punched me, and she had some money. I ain't going to cheat her out of a blessing. I'm just saying, the Bible said you give, you receive the way you give. For example, if some one of you men bought this field out here around the church and planted it with corn, and say, say it gave a pretty good harvest, and you said, Preacher, I, I'm making a profit, but I'm not making much of a profit, so, so I'm just going to pray real hard that God helps me to, why don't you use your head? Instead of expecting God to drop a bale of money out there, plant more corn out there. If you're already making a profit with three acres, plant more corn. Buy a couple more acres, plant more corn. You'll make a bigger profit. The same way it works spiritually. The more you put into it, the more you get back out of it. Hey, listen, the reason me and Debbie get along so good, we put something into this thing. Well, I mean, we've invested in each other. I'm looking forward. Here's why you know you're in love when you look forward to growing old with the person you got married to. I was joking with her one time when uh, she turned 40, and that ain't been that long ago. I said, it's time to trade you in for 220s. She said, you ain't wired for 220, you'd blow a fuse. <laughs> so, amen. God will give us more grace than our finances. Here's what people think. They think, well, if I'm going to pay all my bills. I know I'm telling you preach on tithing, but that's all right. It's, it's in the Bible. Hey, I, I don't care if you pay it or not. I don't look at the books. I don't know who pays and who don't. It don't matter to me. You can keep it. You can sit on it. Let God beat you to death. Take a whipping. That's your business. Your business will fail and your family will suffer. The devourer will be on you. But, but, but people think, people act like, well, so-and-so, he makes more money than I do and he can give more. Maybe he gives more. Maybe he makes more money because he gave more. Maybe she, maybe it's the other way around. Well, she can afford to give more money. She's rich. Maybe she's rich because she gave so much. You ever thought about that? We think about things backwards. We think about it backwards. There's many times that I know that I've put my last dollar in offering plate. Never, never one time over these years have I thought, you know what? I could have bought so-and-so if I hadn't put up that much money in offering plate. I ain't never thought that. Never. Never in my life. It's a joy. I've been out of work before. I've been broke. And I've been laid off. And I know what it's like. So being able to work and make a living, it's a blessing to give back to God. Amen. Amen. I remember one time, right after Candace was born, I don't, shouldn't tell all our personal stuff, but the Lord laid this on my heart. Right after Candace was born, Debbie had a pretty good job, I had a pretty good job. And she got laid off work, so she went back to work, she got laid off. So she went back home, kept the baby, signed up for a while, that worked out pretty good. But she didn't make near as much money signing up. So things were tight that year. We sat all our kids down and said, look, Christmas ain't going to be real big this year. We're going to get you something. But They said, okay. Hey, would you believe this? They are just as happy. They are just as happy with that smaller Christmas that year. Next year, God blessed us and things is better. But that ain't what Christmas is about anyway. Amen. Listen, listen, you, listen. If you'll give, if you'll give out of... Not out of your abundance, but out of your necessity. And give when you can't really afford to give. You talk about a blessing. As a lady in our church asked me one time, she said, Preach, I'll ask you a question. It's personal. I thought, uh-oh. I thought she was going to say, will not you let your hair grow out or something like that? I said, what is it? She said, how do you find all these bargains and these deals all the time? I said, I don't know. They don't, I don't look for them. I said, the main reason is because I don't rob God. You ever thought about that? How else do you explain you can buy a car and it'll drive for 15 years? <laughs> Never had any trouble out of it. Do you know anywhere you can go buy a car and it'll last that long? Amen. I'm just saying God will bless. He'll let your car run longer. He let, won't let your house burn down. And He'll let your kids stay healthy where you won't stay at the hospital. And He'll help you to do better. Help your wife do better. And your ends will meet. You may not be rich, but you look at the guy down the street that ain't living right and doing what he ought to do. You'll see him suffer. I can point people out that I've pastored before and I knew they wasn't tithing. 
I can tell where they live. Just live from just live from hand to mouth, from pillar to post. I can't afford the tithe, so I'm going to do this. Don't work that way, friend. You might try that. Don't work that way. Abraham said, I give tithes of all. Everything. Abraham was saying, when my income tax check comes in, I'm going to tithe off that too. I know y'all don't like that, but I don't care. I've had people come to me and say, Preacher, if I tithe through the year, do I have to tithe off my income tax? I said, you don't have to tithe off nothing if you don't want to. But if it's income, if it comes into you, inheritance or whatever, I believe you're supposed to tithe and give God back. 10%. He could let you be laying broke somewhere. Amen. Preacher, please move on to the next point. Well, the local church is the storehouse. Let me say that. When you do tithe, you don't send it off to Jimmy Swaggart or somebody like that. Hey, if you get sick, Brother Roddy's going to come to the hospital and see you. Jimmy Swaggart ain't coming. None of the Swaggarts are going to come visit you in the hospital. Benny Henny or none of those other chickens are going to come and see you. None of the great healers are going to come and visit you. Joel Osteen ain't going to leave Houston and drive to Hayeshurst to visit you in the hospital. It's going to be your local preacher, and it's going to be these women in here that cooks meals when you have a death in your family. Amen. The local church. Amen. 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 That's truth. Ain't it funny? One Sunday I preach a glory message, and that Sunday I skin everybody from Dan to Beersheba. Number seven, I'm about to close. He'll give us more grace when it comes to our foes. Our foes are enemies. Everybody has them. You might say, preacher, I don't have an enemy in the world. You ain't a Christian then. Jesus said this. He said, they hated me. They hated the prophets. All the old time prophets in the Old Testament, they prophesied the truth. They'd throw them in a pit somewhere. Or they'd tie them up and put them in jail, put them in prison. Did it to Jeremiah, did it to Micaiah, I think that's how you pronounce his name. Elijah, Elisha, all those men suffered because they told the truth. Amen. Amen. You got enemies if you stand for God. Amen. And I want to say, last of all, come on up, Ronnie. God gives us more grace when it comes to our future. Amen. Amen. You look around and you watch what's going on now, watch the news, and you're like, man... I don't care who gets the nominee. I don't know what we're going to do. It's pitiful. I'm like, the, the ones that you think would, might would make a good president don't have a prayer. It looks like it's going to be between Trump and Hillary. I mean, I, I don't even know what he stands for. I like the way he's bold and what it says, what he thinks. And Hillary, some more scandals come out on her. The more scandals comes out on her, the, her, the higher her numbers go. Crazy. Her husband was a whoremonger and a liar, and she's a liar. That's right, she is a bald-faced liar. I wouldn't vote for her for nothing. I couldn't sleep at night. Now, on the other side, who knows? But I do know this. God will give us more grace. You know what the Bible said? The Bible said where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. When sin gets hard and gets rough and the temptations come and life gets more than you can handle... There'll always be more grace. There'll always be more grace. David said, What time I am afraid I will trust in thee. You just put your trust in God this morning. He'll give you more grace. God gave you grace to save you, but He'll give you more grace to keep you and sustain you and keep you going and take care of your family. Let's stand this morning.